that. So first off, the carbohydrates. So these um, kind of a little bit of review from our macromolecules chapter, right? So these come as either simple or complex. Glucose, of course, is our poster boy for these simple um, sugars. So these are the monosaccharides, the building blocks, if you will, to build larger and larger, more complex polysaccharides, the complex carbohydrates. Um, are typically broken down. So when you digest a carbohydrate like starch, for instance, you're going to break that down into its subunit, which is glucose. And so once you break it down into glucose, then you can metabolize it and ultimately generate energy from that, which is really what you want, right? So that energy will basically act as your energy source that will essentially fuel all the rest of the activities in your body. Think of it as sort of like your rechargeable battery, right? So you can basically recharge this um, energy source Every time you eat glucose, you basically dump more energy into that rechargeable battery and you just use it all up again. And then you just kind of keep eating and you keep recharging. Okay. So basically where you're gonna find these carbohydrates, um, and actually before I move forward on that, one thing I also like to point out and a lot of people don't even realize is um, a lot of your cells in your body will use a multiple sources of energy. So fats are high in energy as well. And so you can use fats for like muscle contraction and things of that nature. You can break fats down. That's kind of the idea of working out to lose weight, right? That's kind of where that comes from. Um, however, when it comes to your brain, your brain is the one that really uses glucose and it actually uses a lot of glucose actually to do its activities. As a matter of fact, um, the amount of glucose, the brain can use, like when you're concentrating like when you're heavily concentrating on something you can consume as much glucose as uh, moderate exercise right so you use a lot of glucose when you're thinking so next time you take an exam or when you study load up right eat add your glucose in there so your brain can have the fuel it needs to be able to lock down some of those ideas and those concepts so you can actually think of eating as sort of like a study strategy right so <clears throat> now where do you find these pretty much you find it everywhere right so obviously in the good stuff like cookies um right especially this time of year right you get all those halloween sugar cookies out there and and my big weak spot is oreos i mean that's like evil especially those little gold ones you know it's like those i don't know what they do to those but it's like terrible right i mean i could totally eat myself into a coma um with a bag of those oreos cake eh, not so much into cake some people are cake people i'm not a cake person so i can totally resist cake breads grains things like that these all have carbohydrates and these are high hard carb in nature and so generally speaking you don't want to load up on a lot of these cars so you don't want to necessarily overeat which is typically the american brand over everything right so we are a supersized society and so that's our biggest problem. It's not necessarily what we do, it's that we do too much of it. That's typically where we are. So it's not that you can't have bread or grains or cookies or cake even, but you just can't eat only cake, right? So you can't take an entire half sheet and eat it and consider that dinner, right? That's basically consuming way too many carbs. Um, so when you work with grains, and, and the reason why grains oftentimes, especially like refined grains, Right. These, this is basically processed, processed grains. Uh, the reason why refined grains are a problem um, is because when you refine the grain itself, like when you process that grain, like for instance, oftentimes to um, make flour, a lot of times on the flour bags, they'll actually say it's refined, uh, refined flour. So what that means is they actually remove from the grain, they remove the fiber. And when they do that, they typically strip it of its minerals and its vitamins as well. So really, when you take a look at a refined type of flour, um, then usually it's pretty devoid of most nutrients. It's basically a carb bomb. That's what it is. And that's the reason why there's kind of a push toward this uh, concept of whole grain sorts of things is adding the nutrition back into the grain. So if you're going to be eating grain, then eat the grain, the entirety of the grain, including its fiber and its vitamin, its mineral, because that's where the nutrition piece is. Other than that, it's just a, basically a little bomb of carbohydrate. That's pretty much what it is. Okay. 
And so that's um, something to wait, watch out for, like especially if you're baking and things of that nature. So it's not don't eat bread. It's just, you know, be selective about the bread that you do eat, right? Typically, the more you have to crunch on the bread, probably the better it is, right? I mean, like if you got a bunch of seeds in there and grains that are in there and you're kind of kind of crunching away, that's probably a good thing, right? Because you're eating whole grains and that's good for you, more so than just refined sugar and refined bread. Um, so the complex carbohydrates that we're going to get a hold of, um, oftentimes we can also find other sources of those. There will be some of that in beans, although we tend to think of beans more as a protein source than a carb source. You'll get in other types of things, peas and nuts, which are also protein um, sources as well. You'll find complex carbohydrates in fruits, like fruit pectin and fruit starches and fructose and things of that nature, and of course, whole grain products. And so these are all good because they have all of their nutrition in them, right? So you just kind of want to stay away from generally highly processed stuff, right? The more you process it, what that basically means is we've stripped the food of all of its original value. And then we've basically juiced it up with chemicals, right? It's like, it's like killing somebody and then like doing the Frankenstein thing on them, like reanimating them with a bunch of chemicals so that they're just kind of like, half dead zombies are not really valuable as an actual entity, right? They're just sort of zombies, which is appropriate considering Halloween is tomorrow, right? So you got to slip in the zombie in there somewhere, right? So that's kind of where you get. Now, insoluble fiber is important as well. Um, and so there's two different types of fiber. There's insoluble and soluble fiber. The insoluble fiber is important because typically um, this is undigestible fiber, but what it does is it kind of adds material to your feces. And what that does is it allows um, the free flow of the feces through the intestines, thereby reducing constipation, right? So that's the reason why, you know, if you eat a diet high in fiber, usually you will be moving that material through efficiently. And as a result, you won't be having all these differently highly processed chemicals that are in your food lodging themselves in your colon and staying there exposing your colon to unnecessary chemical. Um, you'll kind of constantly sort of clean all that out. Uh, the soluble fiber is a little bit different and the soluble fiber is typically uh, works along with the bile salts and bile um, and it'll go um, along with cholesterol. And so what it does is it actually prevents the cholesterol from being absorbed. It's, it's kind of the opposite of a co-absorbent. So what it'll do is it'll prevent cholesterol, excess cholesterol from being absorbed, which is one of the reasons why cardiologists oftentimes will tell you, it's like, well, increase your diet, not just in fiber in general, but also as a source of soluble fiber, because if your cholesterol numbers are high, then you're, it's what happens is your liver is making these molecules to manage all the lipids that you're eating. And so if you're eating all these lipids, then the best way for your liver not to see them is to not absorb them. So what you're doing is you're using the soluble fiber as a way to keep from absorbing so much cholesterol, it'll pass it on through, and then that'll reduce your overall cholesterol numbers that your liver has to, has to manage. Okay. So that's one strategy. Um, but what about the harm? So this is where they come from, but can we have too much? And the answer is always yes, right? There is always such thing as too much of a good thing. So if you have a really high intake of carb, like a high carbo diet, um, oftentimes uh, this can cause uh, some problems. So for instance, um, sweeteners, right? So like these high fructose corn syrup, right? Which are basically sweeteners. Uh, they can really contribute um, to obesity. And they have what's called a high glycemic index, which basically means, and that's a marker, typically if you're diabetic, when you're on your nutritional diet, right, your prescribed diet as a diabetic, because you can't just eat everything you want. Um, you generally have to get good at understanding the food that you're eating and what they're doing to your body. And so there's this uh, metric that we use called the glycemic index which helps people understand how a particular food item affects their blood glucose levels. For instance, a food that <clears throat> will really spike your blood glucose after you eat it is said to have a high glycemic index. 
Now, if you're diabetic, that's obviously not a very favorable food, right? And so you would rather choose a different option. So what happens when you spike your blood glucose? Like abnormally so, right? Um, well, what happens is you're, you kind of shock your pancreas into producing lots of insulin to bring that level down. Um, and so if you have this sort of high insulin levels, that's basically always, always going on because you've always got a high glucose, level, then what that tends to do is it creates what's called insulin resistance. So essentially it's kind of like you, you know, the, the boy who cried wolf, you know, you start to cry wolf too many times and pretty soon we just start to ignore the message. Right. So that's what happens. So when you have these chronically high insulin levels, then it will start to create insulin resistance. Basically, that's your target cells. They just stop listening. They're like, um, you know what? You've been nagging at us like nonstop, pretty much um, without ceasing for us to deal with this glucose. And at some point, we're just going to get worn out and we're just going to stop listening altogether. And that's basically what oftentimes leads to type two diabetes. And it's associated usually with um, obesity, um, mostly because that is usually because you're eating way too much glucose, right? Now, this doesn't mean that every single time you have some cake that you're gonna become diabetic, right? This is for somebody who has a chronic habit of eating high amounts of carbohydrates, especially with lots and lots of sugars in it. Right? So because what's happening is you're not just taking in food and getting a glucose spike, that's like your norm, right? Your glucose spike is supposed to be like a rare thing. It's supposed to be like, oh, okay, so we just spiked our glucose, so we'll bring that back down and then we're good, right? And then we kind of stay in this little homeostatic range, ping-ponging back and forth. But if your normal is to constantly take in and spike your glucose over and over and over again. It's like you're always in crisis management, right? It's like somebody who becomes a crisis junkie. If you're knowing those, those types of people, they become addicted to drama because that's kind of like they've wired themselves to always be in the middle of drama. And so it's like when they're at peacetime, it's like they have no idea how to function because it's like they've become so dysfunctional because they're always looking for drama. Oftentimes what they'll do is they'll create drama. If there's no drama around, they'll cause problems and they'll create drama because that's kind of how they function normally. And that's kind of what starts to happen is you're insulting your system with way too much carbohydrate. And it's going to start to have these sort of deleterious effects. So how can you reduce your glycemic index from spiking your blood glucose? Well, number one, and this is a terrible time of year to talk about this, is um, cut out the candy for you who have the candy too, right? I know some of you guys are looking at tomorrow and you're like, this is my time, not my chance, right? Free, free candy, because it's everywhere. You don't have to go trick or treat it to get it. I mean, it's just pretty much everywhere, right? So um, as you all guys all have the candy, right? <laughs> right, so other types of sweets and things of that nature, things we love, right? There's no question about that. These are things we love the most. Um, you soft drinkers. Yeah, there's a lot of sugar in there, right? So if you are uh, given to Coke, um, then you got to cut down on that. That's one of my big problems. I mean, I love my Dr. Pepper. Um, I have to sort of slow that down a little bit, right? Like, uh, you know, not go to McDonald's and drink six large drinks of Dr. Pepper, although I totally could. Right, but kind of slow that down a little bit. Maybe start with water first and then refill with the Dr. Pepper, kind of bring that back down. Uh, but that's a big one, right? Ice cream for you ice cream lovers, not so difficult on a day like this where it's relatively cold outside, but in the summer, right? Ice cream is a tough one. And then of course, pastries, that's my big, that's another big one for me, right? Because I'm a, I'm a pie guy, I like pies. Pie like pastries, turnovers, cobblers, things like that. So. This time of year, holiday season especially, I got to watch out because it's loaded with all sorts of yummy stuff that's never good, right? So a couple things also to back off of a little bit are um, 
some of the fruits, not all the fruits, right? Fresh fruit is good. But some of the fruits, like for instance, oftentimes frozen fruits will be packed with sugar in them. Um, canned fruits oftentimes will have soup in them, which is pretty much all pure sugar. And then uh, fruit juices are oftentimes really, really sugary. That's why they taste so good, right? Um, so kind of back away from those. Uh, like one of the things, just to let you guys know, it's like, now, first of all, you don't have to sort of have the immaculate diet, right? Even just small changes that are manageable are super beneficial, right? Like one of the things that I do that I can do, I don't try to gun for everything, right? But one thing I do try to do, like a lot of times when I sit down to dinner and I want a soft drink, I want to get a Coke out or something like that. Oftentimes what I'll do is instead I'll go to one of the carbonated waters. Like um, there's a whole lot of them now. LaCroix was sort of the original pioneer for that. And now there's uh, bubbly and there's aha and there's all kinds of different versions of that. And, and they don't have any sugar in them. And, but they have the flavor in there. And so I've kind of acquired a taste for some of them. I like some of those a lot, especially the cherry ones. So they're really good. Right. And so I'm totally happy with that. Um, I have no problem with that. So that kind of is a way for me to have my soft drink, but also to cut down on the sugar and the amount of sugar that I take in. So that's just like one little small thing I can say like, well, I like this. So I'll just go ahead and replace it. It's a healthier option and I can kind of go for this. That doesn't mean that I always go for that one. Sometimes, you know, when you want to cook, you want to cook. Um, sometimes I break that out, but I'm able to sort of spread it out a little bit more. So I'm not loading myself up with as much. So um, also <clears throat> sugars. So for instance, white, brown or raw um, and syrups, right? So those all have sugar in them. Even though honey is oftentimes valued for its beneficial products, it's also still sugar, right? So that's also, so you got to be careful on that one. Um, breakfast cereals, right? Your Fruit Loops, your Captain Crunch, that sort of stuff. Got to back off of that one. However, in the breakfast cereal genre, you also have considerably a much wider array of healthy cereals, right? Cereals that are designed to be high in fiber and that have more things in them, right? So they have more grains in them and they have more going on in them. Choose those as opposed to the heartless, soulless, yummy, I would also say, cereals, things like Fruit Loops, right? Or things like that, right? That are largely just pure sugar with really nothing off the, left to the imagination there. Um, jellies, jams, and preserves are oftentimes loaded with sugar as well. When you're cooking, um, instead of using sugar, use spices. This is also another common trick in baking as well. Um, if it's the flavor you're going for, then use spices to get that flavor, right? And this is also helpful like in holiday cooking, where a little bit of use of cinnamon or other types of spices, cloves, nutmeg, all those in that area, will give you the flavor that you're looking for without that sugary punch, right? It'll also help you maybe if you do like your sugar and you're like, yeah, I can't have this without sugar. Um, it'll also it'll allow you to be able to reduce the amount of sugar that you do use. Remember, it's not about being perfect. It's about making some sort of headway in any form that you can. The important thing here is when you're doing dietary changes, <clears throat> it's not about doing the immaculate diet. It's about doing whatever you do making it sustainable, right? I mean, if, if an immaculate diet for you is not sustainable, don't even try it, right? The changes you make, make them with the understanding like, this is something I could do kind of long-term. This is something I could do for a good while. That's what you want to go for, right? So of course, processed foods, we already talked about those, right? With refined um, sources associated with them, okay. Proteins. Let's take a look at proteins, right? So essentially proteins we, di we digest because we need the amino acids. Um, we have essential amino acids, eight of them, though these basically are only attained through our diet, right? So we have 20 different amino acids. We need all 20. But we also need to consume some of the amino acids as well. Now, generally speaking, when we consume a protein, each protein is composed of a different um, collection of amino acids, right? And they don't all have the amino acids that we need. Different proteins will have different amino acids. So for instance, 
um, a complete protein is a protein that will have essentially all the essential amino acids that we need. And oftentimes those come from animal sources. So other types of um, non-animal like meat, for instance, right? Any type of meat, whether it's uh, chicken, fish, uh, beef, whatever, lamb. So typically these will have full complete proteins. And the reason for that is because when you look at us, we're an animal and we're more similar to animals than not. So it makes a lot of sense that we would share similar protein profiles to other animals, which means that when we digest their proteins, they would have similar proteins to us, which means that they would basically be able to serve our protein needs as well because we're more similar. And so a couple of different sources of non-animal for you vegans and vegetarians, um, non-animal sources, tofu, for instance, whatever that is, um, soy milk, <laughs> The tofu always amazes me because it just like a, a good tofu chef, like somebody who's cooking with tofu and has all these crazy recipes. It's just amazing what you can do with tofu. It's like the universal food. I mean, it's like you can do just about anything. Really. It's kind of amazing. Um, soy milk, which is also a derivative of the same thing, right? Tofu is a derivative of the soybean, which gives you tofu, soy milk, and other sorts of things. And so soybeans is sort of like the wonder bean. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with it. And if it actually weren't for soybeans, probably vegetarians and vegans would be in a lot of trouble metabolically because uh, they derive a lot of protein from those sources. However, there's a lot of incomplete proteins. Notice they're coming from plant sources. Why? Because we're not as similar to plants as we are to animals. So it makes a lot of sense that the plant proteins aren't looking like our proteins. And so as a result, they'll give this amino acids that they have but there's gonna be some that we have as an animal that plants don't have that we need. And so oftentimes they'll have a particular deficiency in one amino acid or another. And so um, we have to figure out how to find that, right? So we have to supplement ourselves. So our amino acids, we don't get to store them, we use them or we lose them, right? So we have to refresh them. That's the reason why you have to eat every day is because you need energy every day to feel all your body's demands. And you also need your amino acids every day because you use them up. So you're not just like putting these in a silo somewhere waiting for a lean day. This is, you, you use what you consume. And if you don't need it, then typically you don't consume it. That's how your hunger works, right? So when you're hungry, it's your body needing materials. And so you eat it. If you don't need any materials, then typically you don't have a hunger for the food because you don't need it, right? So, of course, the same question. Proteins are great. They are indeed, but can they be harmful? Well, of course, the answer to this is yes, right? Too much of a good thing can always be, well, too much of a good thing. So what can uh, happen if you take in too much protein, if you have a protein overload? Well, number one is um, you can dehydrate pretty easily while you exercise right? Creating an osmotic imbalance. Um, this will also um, cause a shift in calcium homeostasis that can be dangerous. So essentially you can dump a bunch of calcium into your urine, abnormal amounts of calcium into your urine. This has a lot of uh, effects, right? Because calcium is the main mineral that's stored in your bones. And so if you're losing a lot of calcium, then that's gonna have an effect on the integrity of your bones at some point if it's chronic and severe enough. Immediately, however, if you've got a lot of calcium in your urine and they're sort of hanging out there in high concentrations, they can start to precipitate, form aggregations and create kidney stones. And so that's um, a potential problem. Of course, meat in general can have more fat in it than do uh, plants. Um, actually, plants don't have any fat. Only meat does. Animals, that's an animal thing. Storing fat is an animal thing. So if we eat a lot of red meat, which typically tends to be fattier in nature, in fact, if you watch a culinary expert do the whole meat selection thing and they're looking for the perfect cut of meat that they can grill or cook, you'll always hear them talking about the marbling of the steak, right? What is that marbling? It's fat in the steak because fat, if you talk to a culinary person, Fat is what gives you the flavor. How do you know that? 
because if McDonald's started cooking their hamburgers with lean meat, 97% fat free, nobody would order the Big Mac because it wouldn't taste as good, right? And so we are uh, an animal. And so one of our main cravings, actually, we've already hit on two of our greatest cravings, actually, as mammals, sugar and fat, which is the reason why those two cut together are like our biggest Achilles heel. What takes us down dietarily? It's not the broccoli, is it? You don't break your diet with broccoli or Brussels sprouts. What do you break your diet with? Something sweet or something fat or something that's both like a donut, right? Sweet and fat. I mean, that's like the greatest thing, right? And then you kind of do the whole bacon bits thing in there, right? You kind of put bacon on your donut and you got the triumvirate. You've got sweet, fat, and salt all together with your fatty meat. Yeah, if your heart is like having a hard time beating right now, that's, that's basically called a heart attack, right? So red meat is high in saturated fats, which is one of the reasons that it adds to a lot of cardiovascular disease. And basically, if you have cardiovascular disease or if you're having cholesterol issues or fat load issues, which we all do as we get older to varying degrees, it just gets harder and harder to manage and process fats as we get older. But a lot of times our doctors and our cardiologists will basically say, listen, first of all, number one, back off the red meat. If you're a big meat eater, you're a big red meat eater, don't cut it all out, but just reduce it, right? Reduce your consumption of red meat and reduce your consumption of saturated fats. And red meat is one source of saturated fats. Of course, the entire snack industry is based off of lipids, right? Which is another group. So this is our fats and our oils and our cholesterol. And so we have our two different types where we talked a little bit about this in the macromolecules chapter. So we've got our saturated fats, which are typically of animal origin. So this is essentially our lards. That's lard. And shortening for you cookie bakers, Right? How many cookie bakers do we have out there? This is the season for cookies, isn't it? It gets worse. It's like it starts with Halloween and it gets worse because you start getting the Thanksgiving and and then and then the the, the, the um, Christmas holidays and, and those holidays, whether you're Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever, they all have their own, you know, um, foods that they like to make. And uh, oftentimes none of them are healthy. And that's why they're so delicious, right? By the way, that's the reason why the number one New Year's resolution is to lose weight. Why? Because you porked up over the holidays and now you spend the rest of the year trying to trim yourself down, which is one of the reasons I ride my bike three times a week, pretty much most of the year. As soon as the weather breaks in February or March, it's like I'm on my bike riding and I don't stop until the weather forces me off of it or until the semester ends and then I get into my eating holidays. So I'm a realist, right? I know how to do better. I don't know because um, it's really difficult. So these guys are solid at room temperature, right? So for instance, real butter and things like that. So um, the unsaturated fats typically tend to be liquid at room temperature. So these are the oils. Um, and so you see a lot of animal sources, right? So butter, for instance, um, meat fat. Um, and, and here's a good example of meat fat. I have a bacon grease. Right, you're seeing bacon grease at room temperature. It sets up pretty solid, doesn't it? Yeah, coconut oil actually is. There's a couple of plants. Not all the plants get off on this one, right? So palm oil and coconut oil are actually saturated. They're high in saturated fats. So this is the rare plant source that actually has a very high saturated fat. So if you're cooking with coconut oil, palm oil, it's kind of like cooking with bacon grease. So you're not doing yourself a favor if you're cooking with these two in terms of health choices. So it's not just good enough to say, oh, I'm gonna cook with an oil. You have to be smart about what you're looking at okay, and what you're taking in. So the unsaturated fats, um, they're not as uh, dangerous in promoting cardiovascular disease because, well, they're oils and you oftentimes don't consume as many of them. Good example is corn oil. This is one of the reasons, this is like the main type of cooking oil that you get, like when you just get the 
you know, just the generic cooking oil from the store. That's usually some sort of a corn oil or safflower oil or a combination of the two. Um, so that's basically what you use oftentimes for cooking. And these are high in polyunsaturated fats, right? Which basically means that you don't have to um, use as much. And so also when you take a look at some of these, they also have fewer of the good fats, right? For instance, uh, linoleic and linolenic acid. So not all fats are bad. Different fats actually have beneficial effects. Like for instance, the omega series, right? So you have three different fats, the omega three, six, and nine. And all three of those are typically considered positive, especially in cardiovascular health. They help to protect against cardiovascular disease by giving your body a higher percentage of positive fats so that they're not basically gumming up your blood vessels. Um, they also will help to fuel brain function as well. So um, typically speaking, if you were to take a look at corn oil or safflower oil, they tend to be more polyunsaturated, which tends to be a little bit more beneficial. Um, and so um, olive oil and canola oil, which is another popular one for cooking oil purposes, is a little less healthy because they're mostly monounsaturated, which means they kind of stick together a little bit more. Um, and so safflower oil would be the most. So basically the idea goes like this. The more polyunsaturated fat you have, the healthier you are. Okay. Now, if you have a lot of monounsaturated, it doesn't necessarily mean you're unhealthy. It's just that you're not as healthy as, say, for instance, a polyunsaturated fat. So there's a lot of people who cook with olive oil as a healthy option. Uh, not only that, but it's basically the lifeblood of Ita Italian cooking. Uh, the Italians wouldn't know what to do with themselves if they didn't have olive oil. By the way, it's not just the Italians. It's the entire Middle East, right? That entire Mediterranean area is bathed in olive oil, right? So... We use it a lot for just about everything. And so cooking with it as well, canola oil, not quite as good. And if you have anything that basically is rich in the omegas, right? Omega three, six, and nine, then the idea is use that, take that as a supplement. So for instance, uh, you'll find the omega threes in particular in high representation in fish oil and flaxseed oil. How many of you guys take fish oil or flaxseed oil? I take a flaxseed oil every day. As a matter of fact, fish oil from good fish, not from gutter fish, right? It has to be oily fish. So typically what's the perfect one is, is salmon. That's really what the cardiologist wants you to do. As a matter of fact, fish oil was seen to be so beneficial by the cardiologist that our cardiologists were actually working uh, with patients, they would constantly tell patients, listen, you need to take omega-3s and omega-6. And we have a number for you to look for too. When you take it, look at the back and you should have this much three and this much six. And if you don't have that, you're not getting the maximum benefit. We want you to have this much, right? So if you bring in a fish supplement, fish oil supplement, bring it into your next appointment. We'll take a look at it and we'll say, okay, this is a good source. Matter of fact, this was so beneficial that one of the drug companies was actually starting to to make an actual fish oil or an omega-3 pill that was refined and basically packaged in a pure form, in a pill form. Now it is a super expensive, but also very, very effective. And so what that does, it eliminates a lot of the hard work of getting a good fish oil because you have to really be careful with fish oil. You have to know how it's sourced because the oily fish tend to bioaccumulate toxins like mercury and things of that nature. So you ha can't just get, you know, a bottle of fish oil from Cletus's pickup truck, right? Because you're likely going to kill yourself with that one. There's going to be probably lots of toxins and, and sorts of things like that in there because they're getting it from pretty subpar fish that maybe have a lot of high mercury in them. Right, so you have to make sure. And typically speaking, usually with fish oil, you pay for what you get. So the purer it is, the more money you're going to put down on it. Like, for instance, that particular prescribed uh, fish oil 
was a lot of money. A lot of patients didn't do it because they simply didn't have the money to do it. A cheaper alternative is flax, is flax seed oil. And that's the one I take because, well, I'm not rich enough to take fish oil. Right, so <clears throat> my budget supports tilapia, not salmon, <laughs> which is kind of like the universal fish. Um, tilapia is basically it's gutter fish, right? It's kind of it, it's replacing cod. <laughs> it's kind of like the the filler fish. Um, sorry, if you like tilapia, that's good. Um, it's just kind of the poor man salmon, right? Sometimes call it So it's what we can get a hold of. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? So here we basically have a breakdown of our fats and our unsaturated fats. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see different types of oils. So here we have our canola oil, which you can see is mostly monounsaturated fat. That's the gold one. Not a lot of saturated fat, so that's good. A little bit of polyunsaturated. So canola is not bad. Right. I mean, it's a good one and it's a, inexpensive. A lot of times what you have to be realistic about is not just doing health. Right. I mean, if you were a billionaire, you could probably eat a really, really healthy diet. The problem is the healthier your diet, the more money it costs, which is kind of the cruel reality of a lot of these advices that doctors provide. They nag you and they harass you about eating a better diet without really considering the fact that you don't actually have the financial ability to eat a better diet, which is my biggest gripe against places like McDonald's. Because it's like, even if you know how to do better, you simply can't. Because the only thing you can afford is a cheap hamburger at McDonald's. So in reality, people are dying of cardiovascular disease these days, not because we don't know how to work with it and improve on it, but it's basically people are dying with cardiovascular disease now because of the economy. So basically your economic realities that you put into place, I'm looking at you America, is basically killing people because you can't create a system that will allow people to be able to afford to eat better and to make better choices. So then, you don't have the right to nag me about what I can and can't eat. <clears throat> so you can tell that one of my pet peeves is nutrition because they're like the expert naggers, right? Um, them and the financial industry, they drive me nuts too, right? Because they're all like, oh, well, you should be maxing out your 401k and you should be doing this, this, and that. And it's like, what world do you live in? Like my paycheck is gone every month to support my family. There is nothing to put into the 401k. That's probably true for most people. So it's like, what planet do you, do you come from? I mean, go talk to the billionaires because they're the only ones with the means to do what you just said. That always drives me nuts. Um, safflower oil, really, really good. And polyunsaturated, right? That's the one you want. Unfortunately, if you take a look at the prices of safflower oil in the, in the grocery store, they're not cheap. You're going to pay for that one, right? Now, that's pretty typical. Um, olive oil is even higher in, un, in monounsaturated, but it's still pretty good. It's a better option than just like cooking with grease or something like that. Um, it's not quite as good as canola, right? But it is a good one. Beef fat. Now, if you take a look at this one, all of a sudden you're flipping the script, right? Now, all of a sudden, your big one is saturated. And of course, you have a little monounsaturated in there, but basically over half of that, essentially, you've got controlling interest in this particular situation of saturated fat. Butter gets worse. Coconut oil is actually worse than cooking with beef fat. So if you're cooking with coconut oil thinking you're doing yourself a favor, you would actually be better off cooking with bacon grease. Which sounds a little counterintuitive, right? But of course, our favorite question, can they be harmful? Of course they can, right? Actually, these are probably more harmful in smaller amounts than the others. So why? Because if you eat too many of them, they're going to basically 
cause cardiovascular issues, especially if you're eating high saturated fats and high cholesterol, All right? These two together are going to really, really pork out your problems. So ultimately the reason is because when you take a look at saturated fats, they will add to um, arterial placking. So atherosclerotic placking, and that'll basically close off your arteries and occlude your arteries. You have a blocked artery. Now, generally speaking, the one thing we've noticed actually through dissections um, is from different individuals is that um, atherosclerotic placking is something that will happen as you get older, regardless of your diet. It's just your body gets less efficient at just about everything. And in this case, lipid management is the thing that we're talking about now. And so as it gets a little less efficient as you get older, then you will start to have placking of your arteries. But the idea is you're supposed to be older. What we're talking about here is typically when you're probably half the age, right? So you get accelerated atherosclerotic placking because you have a diet that's very, very high in saturated fats and cholesterol as well. So essentially, when you take a look at the consumption of cholesterol, you have a specific um, carrier for that. So when you measure your cholesterol levels, like you go to the doctor and they measure your cholesterol, they do a lipid panel. In the lipid panel, the one thing they're going to be looking for is your fat molecules, right? Your triglycerides, which is the free fat that's in your bloodstream. And then they're also going to be looking at what's called your good and your bad cholesterol. So they don't literally look at cholesterol itself because you can't, right? What they do is they look at your body's response to the cholesterol you're eating. So cholesterol itself is actually carried around, and this is true for most lipids actually in your body, right? We saw that earlier with the chylomicrons, right? As they pick up those lipids and they bring them into the lacteal. So you have a little protein shuttle that will pick up those lipids. In this case for cholesterol, it's carried along by two different types of proteins called lipoproteins. You have a high density lipoprotein, that's HOL, HOL, HDL. So this is your good cholesterol. And then your low density lipoprotein, which is your bad cholesterol. Now, the reason why it's bad is number one, is saturated fats, put that up here. typically in your diet will increase your bad cholesterol. Now, why is it bad? The reason it's bad is because the bad cholesterol, the LDL, as it's going through your bloodstream, has a tendency to get, it's kind of sticky. And so what it'll do is it'll basically stick into the lining of your blood vessels and it'll stay there. And then as you, more sticks to it, then more gets glommed onto that placking and then eventually you start to kind of close up. So it looks like your artery starts to look like this. So you'll start to see a little bit of placking underneath that starts to form. And as it starts to move underneath, it starts to push up and it starts to occlude as it builds up underneath your liner. So it kind of creates this big blockage and your blood cannot flow past that blockage at some point. So that's what LDL does. HDL is good because ultimately what happens is as it's flowing through your bloodstream, it kind of helps to sort of hurry the LDL on. So like LDL wants to sort of sit down and clog up the artery. HDL will kind of come through and be like, no, 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 no. keep it going. Keep, keep going, keep going. No time to rest, keep going. So it kind of keeps the LDL from parking it and collecting in your arteries. Now, generally speaking, when you take a look at exercise, exercise has the ability to increase your HDL, which is one of the reasons why all doctors can agree that the best thing you can do for yourself and for your personal health is to do two things. Number one, eat a moderate sensible diet that is measured in the number of saturated fats that you're eating. That is low, right? As low as you can get it and exercise. Those two, they agree on that. Now where they disagree is what do we mean by a moderate diet and what do we mean by exercise? But those two working together will help you have a good cholesterol profile. So the more cholesterol you eat, what happens is um, the cholesterol you consume is basically uh, taken to the liver. The liver sees that, right? 
And the more the liver sees that you're consuming cholesterol, the more HDL and the more LDL it makes because it has to make more to carry the cholesterol around. So it's kind of like estimating the population of Denver, not by counting each individual, but by counting the number of houses in Denver with the assumption that each house X equals X number of people, right? So the idea is the more houses, the more people there are, the more houses you have to fill. And so it's not an actual direct measure of cholesterol. It's actually an approximation of the amount of cholesterol because as the cholesterol goes up, so does your HDL and LDL, right? Because you have to use these to manage them. So the other thing and the last piece is of the fats is the trans fats. These are incredibly toxic. And so essentially what happens is when you take unsaturated fatty acids and you hydrogenate them to produce a solid fat. Now, generally speaking, what happens is this is listed in a couple of ways in the nutritional labels. It's listed as trans fats or it is listed as partially hydrogenated. Add whatever you want in that blank. So if you have partially hydrogenated, even if it's safflower oil, that's trans fat because that's the process that creates trans fats. And we see this typically in a lot of processed foods. This is the reason, another reason why you want to stay away from processed foods. So the problem with trans fats is what a trans fat will do is the trans fat will increase your LDL, just like a saturated fat. But in this case, what it also does is it reduces your HDL. It's a double whammy, right? So it basically knocks your ability to sort of have healthy lipid metabolism out from underneath your feet by taking out the good guy while supporting the bad guy. So it facilitates and accelerates placking, which is a problem, right? So, um, and this is difficult, right? Because I mean, I love my Oreos, but also those are trans fat bombs. And so they create a lot of problems, right? Which is one of the reasons why if you're into the holiday cookie thing, which a lot of us are as we start to move into the holidays, don't buy your cookies, bake them. You're better off making them because you have control over what you put in them or what you don't put in them. In this particular case, you don't have to worry about getting trans fats because you're not adding trans fats to them. That's only something that happens when you process the foods, right? So if you buy the package of Oreos instead of making your own cookies, then you're gonna be consuming trans fats. So there's no reason for that, right? Just make your own, it'll probably taste better anyway. So this is basically, if you're wondering where this is coming from or why we even have that, first of all, the important thing to understand is that trans fats are not natural. These are manufactured. And because they're manufactured, your body doesn't know what to do with them. So it can't metabolize them. So you can't clear it out like you would a normal lipid. It just kind of sticks around, it hangs around, it hangs around, it hangs around. And that just basically jacks up your lip. And the longer it hangs around, guess what? The more likely it's gonna stick in your arteries, which causes a problem, right? Which is the reason why you don't wanna eat a lot of these. Um, this is basically, if you're wondering, this is part of the trans fats is actually part of the group of um, additives and foods that go along with the preservatives. Right, so the preservatives, there's a ton of them in there. Think about it, and this is, this is my challenge to you. When you're in the grocery store and you see an item that's packaged, that you know that if you were to make that thing at home, like its life expectancy would be maybe a few days before it starts growing mold, right? But when you look at the expiration date on the package, it's like next year. 
that difference in time, how long it takes to perish when you make it from scratch versus how long it takes to perish when you buy it at the store, that gap is filled in with chemicals and preservatives and things like trans fats. That's the only way you can do that. Trans fats is the reason why in 3000 years, the archeologists will be able to dig through our city dumps and find a fully packaged Twinkie and still be able to unwrap it and eat it. You know what I'm talking about? You guys have access to YouTube as well, right? We've all seen like the eternal quarter pounder in the back of somebody's car that they ordered like in 2001 or something like that. And it's like still back there and it still looks like, you know, right? So what causes that when you know full well that if you made your own hamburger, that thing is gone within a few days? I mean, it's like, whoa, you don't want to touch that thing, right? That's going to be basically preservatives, right? And there's a lot of things like that, especially in these like bakery, um, these like little snacky cookie areas, right? So just remember that. So. How do you reduce lipids? The low fat diet, right? These are all never popular. Why? <laughs> They're about as popular as the low sugar diet, right? Um, why? Because it's one of our instinctual cravings. It just, it tastes good, <laughs> right? I mean, we know that. Matter of fact, marketers know that. They know that about sugar, by the way. That's the reason why everything has sugar in it. They know the way to get you to buy their product is to add a bunch of sugar to it. Matter of fact, you know, it's funny when Coke and Pepsi did their famous, you know, competition, their blind taste test, you know, it's like, which one do you prefer, Coke or Pepsi? They didn't tell them that one, right? They, they, they covered it and they said, okay, drink this one and drink which one you like. And everybody said, let's see, everybody picks Pepsi. You know why? Because it's got more sugar in it than Coke. That's like saying, you're a mammal. If I give you a pound of sugar and let you eat it, are you gonna like that relative to water? Of course you are, right? This is kind of funny. You see this in people's habits, isn't it? Cracks me up because a lot of people, they can't just drink straight water. They gotta put some sort of crap in it, right? They've got all these ridiculous flavor additives and half of those have sugar in them. Why? Because we won't drink it unless we drink some sugar. All the marketers know that. That's why some of the most popular drinks are always the most sugary. It works with condiments too, right? How many people love ketchup? A lot of people do, right? Ketchup on everything, you know why? because ketchup has a ton of sugar in it, as opposed to mustard, which doesn't have any at all, right? So they know that. So fat is the same way. We know that you can't resist fat. And that's the reason why low-fat diets are so difficult to stay on. Okay. So um, how do we kind of help ourselves out? Remember, perfection is not the goal just whatever you can do and sustain it, that's the goal. So for instance, instead of like when you're choosing your protein sources, choose healthier protein sources. So if you like chicken or fish, go for that instead of red meat, right? Beans in particular, that's also a good one. Um, that's a good source of protein as opposed to the more fatty types of sources of protein. Um, when you're preparing your your chicken or your poultry, take the skin off because the skin tends to be a reservoir for lipids um, and also trim the fat from your red meat, right? So little things, we're not talking about massive changes here. Little things can just help reduce the amount of lipids you take in. Try to boil or broil instead of uh, fry. Frying is really bad because basically you're just bathing it in oil, right? It's like, a, I was just a joke um, that, um, our instinctual cravings are so strong that if you basically took a, a sponge and you deep fried it and, and, and salted it, we'd eat it. Because right? if you think about a fry, I mean, that's basically what a fry is. I mean, it's 
has absolutely zero existence outside of a stick to hold the oil and the salt. That's what we're after. And you know that's true. You know why? Because if you got cold French fries from McDonald's, what would you do with those? Throw them away, right? I mean, because I can't remember how many people, somebody's done, you know, McDonald's fries are really, really good when they're hot. But then when they get cold, they're like, eh. Right? Or if you get some fries that don't have any salt on it, what do you do with that? You march right back up there and say like, you know, you need to salt these fries, right? So does it really matter about the fry? <laughs> Not really. I mean, we could give you an empty box that's deep fried in the oil and put salt on it. We'd probably eat it. That's because we're mammals. Lizzie, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. There's definitely a different experience there, right? Yeah. Yeah, make them at home, yeah. So, I mean, that's, no, that's, yeah, that's another thing. Yes, America is also a number one waste society as well. We're incredibly wasteful. Um, even when we try not to be wasteful, we're wasteful. So it's like, you know, all that leftover food that nobody ever claimed or even ate on that's just laying around, restaurants have to throw it in the trash. It's like, oh, why not give that to somebody who's hungry? You know, it's like, it's because we've got this ridiculous set of laws that won't allow us to actually make maximum use of all these things. Uh, so um, when you're eating things like... Um, uh, sides, for instance, butter, like switch from butter to something else, cream, right? Um, that's always a big one. Uh, of course, your source of trans fats. So all those snacky little things, cookies and things like that. Uh, try to lighten up on the shortenings, although it's different. That's difficult, right? So I just told you to make your own cookies. But typically to make a really good cookie, you need what? Shortening, right? It's part of the cookie making metric metric. So that's kind of what makes those cookies kind of nice and soft and kind of pliable. It's the lipid, it's the shortening that gives it that texture that's really so memorable and yummy. So there are some gives and takes here, right? So you can give up on a couple, but it's like, yeah, that one I'm gonna hang on to because I wanna make my own cookies. That's my way I'm gonna reduce trans fats. But in order to do that, I'm gonna give a little bit on the shortening side of things. And so that's okay, you kind of swap back and forth. Stay away from the tropics. Not only will you get malaria, but you'll also pick up coconut oil and palm oils. So stay away from those guys and go to something a little bit more healthy if you can. Can afford safflower? Great. Canola is a good option as well, and that's usually pretty affordable. Okay. So um, herbs and spices, for instance, instead of using things like butter, that's a really good swap out because a lot of times with a if you're really, really, really good at herbs and spices, you don't even need butter or any of those other sorts of salts so because your flavor is already there in the herbs. And so um, those sorts of things. Lemon juice, this is what I tried before, like when I was really trying to cut down. I uh, I did the lemon. It was, it was tough because I love salads, number one. Uh, I'm more of a vinegar guy, right? I'm more of a vinaigrette kind of a guy. So um, I'm okay with that. So a little bit of olive oil and vinegar and I'm happy. So lemon juice is even better, right? But um, I couldn't really pull that one off long term. <laughs> that was not a sustainable strategy for me. But I was able to hit the middle ground, right? So kind of using more of like a just like vinegar and oil. That way I can control the amount of oil that's in there and I can control the amount of vinegar. And I like it just as fine, right? So don't go for the whole milk, right? Because that's got a lot of milk fat in it. Um, so go for the reduced fat milks and the fat-free milks, you can stand it, right? So for me, 2% is my go-to. Uh, I tend not to use whole unless um, there's something like, if you're making ice cream, that's the splurge. Go for that one. But I draw the line at 1%. At 1%, I'm eating my cereal dry. I'd rather eat it dry than put 1% on it. Because for me, that just looks like water that you just put white in it. It's like, that's just, it's just, it's disgusting. 
Um, so it's like putting water on my cereal. So I'm like, yeah, I'd rather eat it dry, you know, than actually put one percent on it. So, like I said, you know, it's not perfection. It's just do what little you can. If you try to do little things, as many as you can, then those all add up uh, in the end, right? And that kind of helps you. So that kind of is a little more manageable. Um, so cholesterol control. Um, first of all, there's a couple things on here that I want to highlight. Number one is shellfish is incredibly high in cholesterol. Um, I remember uh, in our cardiology office, I was working with uh, one of our scheduler. And she was going to have her cholesterol done. It was a weekend. And so she um, had shellfish and then she fasted. And then it's still, even after a 24 hour fast, it's still elevated her cholesterol levels like significantly. Um, and so it's a persistent increase in shellfish. If you eat a lot of shellfish, that's going to really spike your cholesterol. Um, that's going to kind of be an easier one to deal with. Why? Because, well, shellfish is really expensive. So if you only have a McDonald's budget, then that kind of takes care of shellfish right there because it's, you're probably not going to have the budget to afford seafood in general, right? So it tends to be pretty... Um, liver, that's not a good... Because you know, liver is processing cholesterol in most animals. So if you're eating liver, it is high in iron, that's true, but it's also high in cholesterol. So that's bad, right? Um, cheese does have cholesterol in it because you're basically taking the cholesterol that we associated with the milk products and you're condensing it down into like a really little tight condensed bomb. Um, egg yolks, you know, historically egg yolks have absolutely been completely character assassinated since the 90s. And the problem is we actually now know that um, egg yolks are not as bad as everybody say they are. And eggs in general. And because they're balanced by a lot of other things, right? They are essentially a quintessential primary source for protein. And so they are enormously rich um, food sources. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I need to stop eating eggs. That's not the strategy, right? There's better ways to reduce your cholesterol. So like going after red meat would be the first place I would start. And if you're big on seafood, uh, that'd be another that'd be another one. Seafood, shellfish in particular, not fish, right? Fish tends to be health promoting. Shellfish tends to be health demoting in general. Okay. Um, so the for cooking purposes, you have egg whites and yolks. But the nice thing about cooking is you have egg substitutes, and I've actually tried those. Um, and they're actually pretty good. Uh, they're pretty, you know, like some of those um, artificial eggs, like artificial egg whites or fake egg whites or fake egg yolks. They're actually pretty good. I've actually tried some. I've actually made omelets with some of those. And it's actually not bad. So I mean, if you really want to go after eggs, I mean, some of those egg substitutes are actually pretty good. Now they're a little pricey, but they're, they're definitely a good experience. I've, I've actually done. And of course, increase your soluble fiber, right? If you're going to be eating cholesterol, then increase your soluble fiber so that you can not absorb as much cholesterol as you're eating. So where do you get some of that from? So oat bran, that's those cereals again, right? The health giving cereals, you gotta know how to shop in the cereal aisle. Oatmeal, which is part of that whole cereal area. Um, fruits, such so apples, citrus fruits, cranberries, right? These are all high in soluble fiber. So it is true, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? At least it gives you a little bit of soluble fiber to help reduce the amount of cholesterol you're taking in. So notice your strategy here. Let's imagine that you say, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm not going to reduce my egg intake, right? Because eggs provide too much protein, which I need, and I'm gonna stick with my eggs. So if you know you're gonna be taking in that cholesterol, then what you should do is you should help to buffer that with also increasing some of these sources of soluble fiber. If you're gonna be taking in a lot of cholesterol, at least take in a lot of soluble fiber so that you can reduce the amount of that cholesterol that you absorb, right? And you know that would be kind of a nice, a nice balance, kind of a nice balance strategy. Notice it's not about doing one thing or another. It's about balance. It's about doing a lot of little things 
that are sustainable, but doing them chronically, right? That's kind of the key. And that's where most diets fail is because they don't do little things that are sustainable and chronic. What they do is they try to do one big thing that's unsustainable. And then everybody fails the diet. And then they feel bad about themselves and then they just created a bigger problem than they had before, right? So, so minerals, basically these are, um, these usually inorganic molecules, they're usually metal ions. And we have two different major uh, pieces of the major minerals and the trace minerals. So trace basically means there's very little that's necessary that you need. And of course the major minerals are the ones that you need in larger quantities. So for instance, the major mi minerals, um, you're gonna need them typically in over an excess of 100 milligrams per day. Um, trace is less than 100 milligrams per day. Um, and so generally speaking, the major ones we use a lot. So these are things that we use a lot in cells and body fluids. Um, oftentimes they'll help us to form structures in particular tissues. Trace minerals um, are usually part of larger molecules. Like for instance, the iron in hemoglobin is a trace mineral. Um, and so the zinc and copper and manganese in certain enzymes, they help enzymes do their function. Those would also be trace in nature. So it's kind of what it looks like. This is a nice little table. I don't want to go through all this table. It just kind of lays down a lot of the minerals that we have in our body and what they do. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a spectrum of how these are deployed. So calcium, for instance, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, magnesium, and it keeps going, zinc, iron, copper, um, iodine, selenium, and manganese. A lot of different ions in there. Notice all of these are metals. These are all metal ions but they all have basically different roles to play in different aspects of your physiology. And they also, the thing I like about this table is they'll give you different food sources that you can use to get a hold of these minerals. Of course, oftentimes we will be uh, mineral deficient. And so we can basically supplement that with a good supplement, right? Now supplement, remember, is not designed to be replace your nutrition. Typically, when you're looking at a healthy diet, the idea is that you're getting most of what you need from your diet. And then those things that you don't have enough of, you can take your supplement in order to sort of top it off. It's not designed to basically be like, oh, I'm going to take one vitamin and one mineral, and that's going to be all, all I have for the day. I'm not going to eat anything today. And that's, going to, that's not how it's supposed to work, right? So it doesn't replace your nutrition. The idea is the most, most of what you should be getting is from your food. Now that's a problem because one of the realities we have in our food industry is that our food is actually becoming less nutritious. So we're getting less nutrients from our food as the generations go forward, which is problematic, right? Because that's where we're supposed to be getting our nutrition from. So what happens if we have deficiencies in some of these minerals? So for instance, if you have a deficiency in iron, uh, which can happen, you would expect your um, your oxygen binding in blood to be suffering for that, right? So you're not gonna be able to bind as much oxygen in your blood. Yeah, calcium, magnesium, or zinc, uh, basically, uh, if you don't have enough of these, you oftentimes will get deficient in these and they'll have different types of disease states associated with them. So females in general need more iron. And the reason why they need more iron is because they lose a lot of blood during menstruation. Men don't, right? So we don't have to constantly replace that iron. This is one of the reasons why a lot of times that iron deficient anemia can be a problem, which is one of the reasons why abnormally heavy uh, menstruous or chronic bleeding is a cause for concern in females and why that needs to be addressed because essentially what's gonna happen is you're gonna to start to lose a lot of that blood and a lot of that iron. You're gonna run into iron deficiency as anemia if it gets too severe and we have to stop that quickly because otherwise it could become life-threatening. And so if you have a nice balanced diet, then the idea is you provide enough materials, energy, vitamins, and minerals in order to be able to supply all of your metabolic needs. Now, calcium itself, just to kind of highlight a couple of these minerals, um, is going to be essentially important. Uh, you're going to see this in bones and teeth. And so the importance of calcium is several different things. First of all, you're going to need this for muscle contraction. 
So your, your, your main signal for muscle contraction is calcium release in your muscle fibers. If you don't have calcium, then you're not going to be able to contract your muscles, and that's a bad thing. You also need calcium for blood clotting. So if you're low on calcium, you can basically hemorrhage from just a minor event. Okay, So you need to have that in, involved in blood clotting. It's also one of the ions. There's three main ions associated with nerve impulse conduction um, that you need, and calcium is one of them. So when you take supplements for calcium to keep your calcium levels up, the idea is this will prevent osteoporosis, which is essentially the osteo means bone, pore means holes. This is a condition of bone holes is what that means. Osis means condition of. This is a condition of bone holes, what that actually word means. So this is when you start to lose bone density and you start to lose calcium. And so calcium supplements will basically pack into your bone tissue and that will maintain the integrity and the density of your bones. The primary thing, as a matter of fact, what makes bone solid and hard is a molecule called hydroxyapatite, which is a combination of calcium and phosphate. It's like the curative agent that sets bone up hard. And so you pack a lot of that calcium in this form into your bones. But when you have osteoporosis, what's happening is you're breaking that hydroxyapatite down and you're releasing that calcium out. And so you're getting lower and lower bone density because you're losing that calcium in your hydroxyapatite. You're basically losing the hardness of your bones. And it starts to look kind of like, uh, like a sponge, like the, pore, the holes in a sponge. Now, vitamin D is important. So here's how your vitamins will interact with your minerals. Uh, because basically what vitamin D will do is it'll prevent bone loss by allowing you to co-absorb calcium. So vitamin D will allow you to absorb calcium better when you do ingest it. Like, like if you drink milk, which is high in calcium, or if you take a calcium supplement, vitamin D will work with calcium to allow it to come into your digestive system more efficiently. And thereby packing that into the bone, which prevents bone loss. Sodium is an enormous ion. So this is one of the most important ions in all the body. So first of all, it's used in water balance. So your osmotic balance, that salt water balance in your body. It's also used to move different molecules across the membrane into and out of the cell as they need it. Um, it also is the main mineral in your nervous impulse. And so there's a lot of important physiology that sodium is involved in. And generally speaking, normally we should be taking about a gram and a half of salt a day. That sounds like a lot. And it is a lot. But it's usually not a problem because it's our third instinctual craving. Sugar, lipids, salt. And typically our diet is in no shortage of salt. So we usually take easily over twice as much salt as we need. That's another difficult one because salt is one of those things that we have a very, very strong taste for. Uh, to the point where if you eat something that's low salt, it's like, blah, right? I made the mistake once of eating low salt green beans, like no salt whatsoever. And it was just like, I mean, I almost lost it. It was like, oh my gosh, this is like the worst thing I've ever tasted. Um, and I actually made lentils um uh, as well and i i have a lot of traumatic history with lentils I've, that's never gone well i know they can be cooked well uh i just I have never met anybody who does and i've never done it myself so i've got a lot of ptsd associated with lentils and there's they're just varying shades of oh my gosh this is nasty um and i did a low salt version and i was like oh my gosh and it was so nasty that I basically dumped a bunch of salt in it to get it like to the place where I could like, okay, I can't even, I can't even touch this. <laughs> and I was like in grad school, right? So it's like, I don't have money to eat anything else. So this was it. This, is, this was it. So I had to do something to make it so I could actually force it down. So, um, but that's because it's an instinctual craving for us. Um, and we get way more than enough that we need. Unfortunately, it can cause problems. Right, so you can create hypertension, you can create a lot of problems with salt, too much salt. 
So reducing dietary sodium, this is a, a these are not popular, right? So you don't win points with this one, the low salt diet. So spices, for instance, instead of salt, sometimes that works really well, right? Because if you, especially if you acquire a taste for the spices and you get really good at it, you can really create a lot of fascinating flavors and things like that that are much better than salt. Um, being realistic, you're going to add salt, but just try to add a little bit, right? Not a lot. Um, so you can add it when you cook or don't. Most people do the mistake of they double add, right? They add salt when they cook and then they add it after the meal. Do one or the other, right? And that's, that's what I cut down on. Um, also, here's unsalted. Now, I don't know about you. Unsalted crackers, pretzels. But, so first of all, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. Um, these are snacks, right? And part of the power of these snacks is the salt. So if I've got an unsalted potato chip, guess what I'm doing? I'm just not going to eat the potato chip. I mean, what's the point, right? I mean, my piece of cardboard without the salt and without the lipid in it is a piece of cardboard. I generally don't just eat the cardboard just for free. So if you remove the salt, it's like, uh, what's the point? Right? Um, nuts to varying degrees. Actually, nuts could be quite yummy, raw, or lightly salted. And popcorn is another one that can also be quite yummy without salt. Right? So there's some things that you can do and some things you can't. I would argue pretzels, no, sorry. Um, there's some things that are just non-negotiable. If they don't have the salt in them, then don't put them in front of me because it's just, it's nasty. At some point, you know, you're just, you should just give up on it rather than trying to manipulate it into a healthy version, right? So here's another one. And this is a hard one for me, right? Um, avoid the processed meats. Pretty much everything on this meat and this list I love. <laughs> it's like, um, my goal is to die with a hot dog in my mouth and a bag of potato chips in my hand. At least that's what my wife always says. You know, you're going to die with a hot dog in your mouth. It's like, yeah, probably. I mean, it's one of the things I have. I love hot dogs. I absolutely love them. I like ham. I can live without bacon. Um, bologna, salmon, just out of my price range. So I don't even worry about that one. Um, I do like sardines and anchovies. But this is one of those ones where it's like, um, I'm sorry. I'm not going to alter this one. This is just one of those ones where it's like, yeah, I know I should do better, but I'm not. So my strategy here is to not eat four hot dogs, maybe reduce the number of hot dogs I eat, right? Or reduce the number of chips I eat. I'm not talking about avoidance, that's just not going to happen. I'm sorry, that's not realistic for me personally, right? Because I just, I love hot dogs. And so that's gonna be not a, not a thing. Um, cheeses. Can dehydrated soups. These are tough, aren't they? I'm that I'm a cheese person too. I can slow down on cheese, but man, I love cheese, especially the stinky cheeses. You know the those the the, the expensive ones. I I love those different types of cheeses. What they can do there, I can slow down on that one though. Right, that one I I can't slow down on. But man, canned soups. Let's face it. When you guys are getting into holiday cooking. Some of these soups are like foundational pieces to a lot of our cooking strategies, right? Especially as you start to move into holiday cooking situations. But they also have a lot of salt in them. Anything that has brine in it. Pickle lovers, looking at you. Olives, I love them both. Sauerkraut, absolutely. Those are all high in salt. So that's another one. Sorry, I'm not ordering a Big Mac without my pickles on it. Which is not going to happen. So I know there are some things I can work on, but there are definitely some things where it's like, you know what? It's kind of not worth it to me. Right. So I can avoid salt in other places, but this is not one of them. This is my choice. This is about give and take. Right. That's kind of where it goes. And read your nutrition labels. There's a lot of things with salt in it, a lot of salt in it that's not necessary. So read your nutrition label to say like, you know what, this particular thing right here, I'm actually okay with this one in a low salt version. There are some things like that, 
right? So here's a good example. My surprise this drives me bats. Because Walmart, of course, is, is cheap. I hate it. I hate the place. Absolutely hate it. But I have to go there because the prices are the only things that I can afford half the time. Right. And the thing I hate about Walmart is those cheap spices that they got in those bins. I'm always a sucker for those, right? They're like 98 cents or something like that. And spices are expensive, right? But it drives me nuts because you get a spice in there and like you're just looking for the spice. But it's like they always add all this damn salt in there. It's like, you know, you get for lemon and pepper and all you want is the lemon, the dehydrated lemon and the pepper. That's all you want. But then they put a bunch of salt in it or like garlic, right? They don't give you garlic powder. They give you garlic salt. It's like a bunch of salt. It's everything's got salt in there. I'm like, stop with the salt. I would rather have just the spice. That's one of those ones where it's like, I can avoid the high salt products and try to find something that just has the straight spice in it. That's a good way to avoid excess salt intake. Remember, we're not looking for perfection, just doing what you can do and making it sustainable. Does that make sense? Pick and choose your battles, right? That's the biggest problem. We're the reason why we fail in a lot of these situations is because we think we pick on a battle we have to take because somebody told us that in the book. And in reality, it's like, no, that's not the battle you want to take on. Just take the ones you can, you, take the battles you can win and just win them every day. Something sustainable, something easy, accumulates over time is much more powerful than going on a diet for a few months in the beginning of the year and then failing it somewhere around March or April. Right. So vitamins, these are organic compounds. And so typically these are involved in metabolism. And so oftentimes you need to take them in. You can't make them. Um, you typically have to ingest them. And they typically are part of the enzyme complex. So they help the enzyme do its job. There are 13 vitamins. A couple of them are fat soluble. Some of them are water soluble. So there's a lot of them. So this is our vitamin table. So ADEC. This is the fat soluble ones. And so um, like with the minerals, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'm just gonna sort of point out a couple of them, but they show you your functions, where you get them from, um, what your deficiencies are associated with them. But these are your fat solubles. Then of course you have your B complex, which are important. Your vitamin C, which is a good one. And then um, a couple of your, um, other so biotin, for instance, is um, a good source is eggs, right? So don't beat up on eggs because it does have a lot of good nutrition in them. They do have cholesterol in them, but they do have good nutrition in them. So be balanced about it, right? So don't just you know vilify something and then just let it go. Be balanced about it. You're going to get some good and some bad with everything you do. So it's all about balance. If you add in a little bit of good along with the bad, then you balance everything out. That's what it's all about. And that's the thing we're the worst at is attaining balance, right? We tend to go whole hog on one side of things and not, and not have a balanced approach to things. Okay. So these are your major, um, I'll leave, I'll let you guys kind of go through that table. That's kind of like your little table piece and I'll kind of let you guys sort of take a look at that. Um, another thing that we have is what's called antioxidants. So antioxidants basically will um, decrease the oxidation uh, byproducts of metabolism. So basically, whenever you do uh, metabolism, during this process, your oxygen consumption will spit off these oxidative byproducts. So they essentially detoxify. oxidative byproducts. Things like, for instance, superoxide and hydroxide. These are very, very nasty sorts of things, right? So free radicals. So what these are basically are molecules that are very unhappy because they've got unpaired electrons. And so in order to satisfy themselves, because they're very unhappy that their electrons are unpaired, what they will do is they will basically you know, rob and pillage anything near them that they can get a hold of to steal their electrons from them, including your tissues. So if a superoxide or a free radical has this aggressive personality, then it's going to take an electron from Brian. Now he's with that electron. If he's a tissue cell, that could damage the tissue. If he's a DNA, 
then that could mutate the DNA, which could ultimately lead to cancer. Which, and this is something that would happen as just a normal process of consuming oxygen. Matter of fact, because of this, these can be quite cell toxic. The only reason why we can breathe oxygen and use it is because we've got a lot of strategies to detoxify these structures. Like in our cells, we've got organelles called peroxisomes whose job it is to detoxify these byproducts. And there's enzymes that will do this. We also have antioxidants, which are molecules like for instance, C, E, and A, and other sorts of things, right? There's antioxidants, like carotenoids, for instance, are antioxidants. There's a lot of molecules in blueberries. Pomegranates are antioxidants as well, have a lot of antioxidants. What an antioxidant does basically is it kind of throws themselves in front of a bullet. So let's imagine that I'm coming after, I'm a superoxidant, I'm coming after Brian, he's a tissue cell. So if he ate a bunch of antioxidants, what would happen is the antioxidant could come in and shield him from the superoxide and be like, no, take my electron, Take me, but take, save him, right? So that way, the antioxidant is the one that gets the electron taken, not the tissue. So it basically spares you. We see a lot of this in fruits and vegetables, which is one of the reasons why you need to eat a lot of your fruits and vegetables, right? So vitamin D, we talked about a little bit. So basically, vitamin D is one that begins its process, its journey, is gonna be happening in the skin. It's usually associated with UV exposure. So a precursor of vitamin D is gonna be started and created in the skin. It'll go to the liver ultimately, and it'll be modified again. And then eventually it will be secreted by the kidneys who finally make the final product, which is a hormone called calcitriol, which is basically vitamin D. So if you take a look at a vitamin D supplement, oftentimes in parentheses next to it, it'll actually say calcitriol because that's active vitamin D. So then what this does is basically it absorbs or helps calcium to be absorbed by the intestines at a much higher frequency. So getting that calcium into your system, which is good because that's one of your trace minerals that you need a lot of that you need in order for your physiology to work out. This basically will essentially increase your absorption of that calcium when you get it. So what if you happen to be deficient in vitamin D, then you end up getting rickets, which is a deficiency in calcium. Now, if you have a deficiency in calcium, that means you're not going to be able to make that hydroxyapatite, which is the hardening agent in bones, which means your bones are not going to be able to harden appropriately, and they're going to be a little too flexible, a little too elastic. And then that's where you're starting to get the bowing of the legs because you don't have appropriate mineralization of your bone itself. This is also the reason why in milk, which is already high in calcium, is also oftentimes fortified with vitamin D because you have the two together. Vitamin D is the coabsorbent that allows calcium to enter into your intestines at a much more efficient rate. So basically the way we serve milk now, the way we sent cell milk now is actually much more nutritious than it was before, like with just whole milk because we supplement it with vitamin D to make sure that you're not just getting the calcium, but you're also getting maximum absorption of that calcium. Okay, okay. so what we'll do is we'll start here I'm sure you'd probably love how to plan a nutritious meal after I just went on my hot dog bench, right? Um, so we'll start this one next time. <laughs>